who you want to change. You know there's better for you. God touches your heart. And then you get around a group of people who almost like they showcase the things that they do, the Bible scriptures that they read, the prayer sessions that they go to, and all of a sudden it turns into a little bit of, check me out, I'm awesome, and God thinks I'm awesome. Has, am I the only person who's ever been to that experience? Okay. And I believe that God, what he gives to us is not so that we can impress each other, but because God desires to impress upon you and I how to begin to experience the fullness of his goodness and his grace, that's what prayer does for me. It doesn't give me brownie points. It lets me get in the presence of God and begin to take his word and to begin to speak it over the situations of my life where God has said, I am your victory. I am your ally. I am the one who shall supply all of your needs. I am your peace. I am your healer. And I get to be in relationship with him. And I can have the choice of not being in relationship with him, and then I get to live in the words and the experience of life that comes and heaps, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, and doggone it, people do not like you. And you all of a sudden have to live in the drudgery of every day with this expectation, will, is this the cycle? I get a job, I get an education, I raise some kids, I shower, I brush my teeth, and then I teach my children to do that. And God has so much more for us. I was thinking about coming into today some elements of the laws of gravity and some of the laws of aerodynamics that have existed throughout the ages. And they, they've been in existence and they've, they've been there for each and every one of us to, to be able to grab hold of, but it wasn't until the Wright brothers decide to harness the wisdom of the laws of gravity and aerodynamics that they began to soar. And some of us, we, you'd agree with that, right? I mean, you'd agree that that happened, that the laws of gravity and aerodynamics, they, they existed, but it wasn't until two people dared to believe that they could tap into those things in order for them to soar. And I have this feeling in my heart and a stirring that God wants us to begin to take flight in 2013. And it's going to come as the result of us not just giving lip service or just uh, hearing some information, but for us harnessing the very laws that God has had in existence so that we can begin to put them into practice so that we can begin to step out and test them like the Wright brothers did so we can begin to soar in every area of our lives. And so for the next several weeks, we are going to dive head first because this is where I am at and you get to follow me as I am leading us at E3 Church in uncovering some of the strategies of the wealthiest and smartest and wisest of individuals ever, and that is Solomon. Solomon, and appropriately titled, titled Solomon Strategies. And so we're going to look at some things and uncover some things because Solomon applied and acted in a very specific way that I think that you and I, going into this year, could, could really look at, study, and understand and grasp that is different than what you and I might think about Solomon. Obviously, we know that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, um, and, and he, was, he, he was uber rich. He was a trillionaire. He had uh, measures of gold, for those of you who like to invest in silver and gold, it's become very popular in our time. He had 730,000 ounces of gold, which would equate to, if you knew where gold was at today, a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. Now, Solomon almost got robbed. He was the son of King David, the son of Bathsheba, which is interesting, but I'm not going to go down that road. But he was the son of King David, and he almost got the, the kingdom when David was on his deathbed robbed from him. But his mom sort of brought him to King David, and it was his natural, it was, it was the progression that was to take place, what King David had on his heart. And so um, mom brought uh, uh, Solomon to King David and, and basically fought on his behalf. Now, at the time, Solomon was 12 Everyone say 12. 12. I don't know what you were doing at 12 years old, but I wasn't doing a whole lot. I mean, maybe it was the dawn of Sega 
or Nintendo 64. I don't really remember. It's been a while ago. But 12 years old, God calls on Solomon to be the king. And Solomon was super excited to lead. Not true. Actually, he was freaked out. He was terrified. And he does some things that is pretty huge that you and I, I believe, for the tone of this year, we need to grasp a hold of. Now, the Bible says that Solomon was wiser than all men. Second Chronicles 9.22, it says, King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Do, do, should we take some time? I mean, I'm just asking based on those two passages. Sh should we take some time to hear what this guy had to, to say? What this guy did? I mean, do you think? I mean, this is, this is the one who built the most magnificent temple. He's the one who uh, basically um, fortified and set up um, the, the kingdom of Israel in, in such a way that it was just, just downright miraculous and huge. Now, the thing that Solomon did, he, he began to, and let me read a passage of scripture found in Proverbs 2.4 to set, set us up here. It says this in Proverbs 2, and this is out of the Message Bible. Good friend, take to heart what I'm telling you. Collect my counsels and guard them with your life. Tune your ears to the world of wisdom. Set your heart on a life of understanding. That's right. If you make insight your priority and you won't take no for an answer, searching for it like a prospector panning for gold. Like, like an adventurer on a treasure hunt, believe me, before you know it, the fear of God will be yours. You'll have come upon the knowledge of God. So he's the one that penned this passage, the richest man that ever lived, the one who was wiser than all the kings. He writes these words and he tells us how to go after something that he found brought him great success. It says, wisdom and understanding, I want you to put on your prospector hat, I want to bring out your pan, if you Watched some reality shows recently. Maybe that'll help you to identify some people out searching for gold nowadays. And, uh, and I want you to go after it with the same tenacity because it is the very thing that will transform and reshape every bit of your life. Now, there's some elements of, of Solomon's life, honor and humility, authentic prayer, and, and obviously wisdom, and mapping Vision mapping, in fact, that, that he did that I think are important for you and I to take a look at. In 1 Kings 2, 1 through 4, it says, When David's time to die approached, he charged his son Solomon, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, but you be strong. Show what you're made of. Do what God tells you. Walk in the paths he shows you. Follow the life map. Absolutely. Everyone say life map. Keep an eye out for the signposts. Um, his course for life set out in the revelation to Mo Moses, then you'll get, on, you'll get on well in whatever you do and wherever you go. Then God will confirm what he promised me when he said, if your sons watch their step, staying true to me, heart and soul, you'll always have a successor on Israel's throne. We actually know that uh, what I appreciate about Solom Solomon and all of his wisdom, he also had a little bit of a rocky life. There were parts of his life where he followed true, um, really what God had set aside for him. And there were times when he sort of backed off on it. <laughs> if you watch the last portion of his life, he had a lot of wives and a lot of heartache then ensued. But we're not going to be talking about that portion of his life. We're going to be talking about the part where he sought after wisdom. Now the first thing we see that happens in his terrified state, and this translates for you and I, if you're experiencing any type of fear for the future, for what lies ahead, for what God's placed on your heart, what he's called you to do, wondering when it will come to pass, wondering if it will happen, trying to lift yourself up to make sure that it all gets organized because God, you know, he's just not coming through on the time plan that you're thinking. Listen to what he does as he's terrified. He comes to God and he says this, 1 Kings 3, 7 through 14, and I ask that this might be the thing that you put on the mirror if you are one of the people who put scriptures on your mirror, all right? He prays, now, Lord, my God, you've made me your servant king in place of my father, David, but I'm only a little child. 
and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So he's humble. He recognizes that what's ahead is not possible for him to fathom. I get it, he's 12, but he's still got something huge in front of him. But the next words, pay attention, he says in verse 9, So give your servant tons of cash, lots of gold, some silver, and some wise people to surround me so that I can make this thing happen, God. Is that what he says? No. In, in the most probably powerful passage for you and I as we navigate our life, for direction, these words are here. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, you keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I'll give you a long life. And Solomon said, thanks God, and walked away. No, I'm just joking. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It almost like you, you could hear jackpot sounds going off, right? Now, don't, don't, dis, don't get disillusioned by me saying that. But, I mean, he had to be like, yes, I just prayed the right prayer. I, I got that one right, you know? And, and, and he opens his heart up to discernment and wisdom and understanding. And truly, I believe that, that God wants to awaken us to the same thing. Sometimes, you know, and we see throughout Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, where Solomon gives us insight that quick wealth, don't, don't do it. <laughs> it just goes away. I mean, we know lottery winners, percentage-wise, they all lose it, or individuals who want to short short change and short circuit the system because ultimately we don't want to really trust in, in, in basically what God has set aside for us to be able to believe that he's our, he's our provider, he's our supplier, that he, what he's given us, Deuteronomy 8.18 says this, that God has given you the power to get wealth. That's in the Bible. I did not fake that or make it up. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8.18 that God has given you the power to get wealth. A lot of times when we start to trust or believe God, uh, sometimes we short circuit that. Somebody comes up to us and says, and I've had a lot of these, I don't know about you, gives us a new fandangled way to make some super quick, awesome cash. And we're like, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty awesome. But Solomon always tells us, beware. It, even if it happens, even if you make a bunch, just beware because the way that you get something that quickly, it just really won't be that important to you. And something will happen, and I don't know about you, but it, it'll just kind of flee by the side. And so he opens us up, and, and he awakens us. And I want to be a person that is, is pursuing what God has in store for my life, for our church, for your lives. I want to lead us in a way that you and I begin to seek God's wisdom and his understanding before anything and before everything. Can you get on that page with me? I mean, as opposed to imagining all the things that could happen. Now, let me tell you a little, let me just share this little nugget as a pastor of E3 Church. When, when Noel and I came to this city, God had, had, had laid something on my heart, some specific words, and this is all I got, okay? This is, this is it. Many of you know, Brad, I want you to reach the city. Now, I have spent close to nine years understanding what God had in mind. And some have, have likened me to a moron. Uh, some have wondered, and during that time period, I've had other people that have come, I'm just giving you my life example, how about that? Brad, are you sure you heard God? 
you know, I mean, you don't have 20,000 people here. Are you sure? Yeah, that's, that's not what God said. He gave me three words. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to believe him. I'm going to watch as he leads because he just told me God, or Brad, he didn't call me God. Brad, <laughs> sorry. Brad, I want you to reach the city. Now, as I look back, I see the wisdom and the discernment and the understanding as God has peeled off layers in my life so that he's opened my heart up to have a passion more for specific areas in our city and people and, and, and groups. And he's made me more likable. Um, I mean, I've been, I, I was a part of a very large church and I was very good at doing some things in large church and being I just, anyway, and, and people would say, wow, he seems like a very nice young man. He, he must love the Lord, and I did all the things. And God sort of like messed my hair up and put some, some converse on my feet and was like, Brad, I want you to learn how to love people. And, and some people have said, Brad, you're crazy. Why do you work a full-time job? Because I had spent 11 years in full-time ministry, and, and all I knew was the culture of church. All I knew was bringing people to church and doing church things. And God said, you know what, Brad? I want you to try to establish a place where life would not center around church because the church is not the building. The people are the church. I want, light, or I want church to revolve around life. And would we begin to integrate and see and be in places where people are at so that people could experience the love of God? But it's still been a long time. And, and I, I just, I think early on, just gave up what God had in mind necessarily specifically as to what it meant when he said reach the city. And I decided I wanted to trust him and to follow his wisdom and his understanding and his lordship and his leadership so that I wouldn't in my puny brain attach anything to it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever attached any meaning to exactly what God said or, or he gave to your heart? Did you make it mean something? Did you build a picture? Did you, did you have in mind when it would happen? Yes, you did. Okay, I answered for you. You did. You do. Because we're impatient. We're like my four-year-old who just cannot, you know, dad, come on, dad. You know, that's how we are. And God says, I know you. I know you. You're not, just trust me. I'm, I'm ready, God, do this. Blow it up. Let's do it, God. No, no. Pay attention. Seek after wisdom. Seek after understanding. Learn to bloom where you're planted. Learn to look out your door at your neighbors. Learn to love people. Learn to open up your heart. Learn to be generous. <laughs> I gotta be important. I gotta be awesome, God. Make me awesome. I want your purpose for my life if I'm awesome. That's all I want, to be awesome. I mean, I, I, God has never led me wrong, but sometimes I have to let go of what I think is awesome, and I'll tell you what, what God has and what he sees as awesome for you is so far beyond what you think is awesome, because you don't even know awesome. I mean, he made the planet. He is the creator of the masterpiece, so you are not, right? And so, I want to be a person that is seeking his wisdom and seeking understanding so that I, at the right moment, when, when God begins to start to set things in, in motion and alignment, that I am prepared. Now, I don't want to take away expectation. I don't want to take away our heart because that, that has never gone for me. I mean, I come each week, I hope you know this, and I am, I am. Never once, I hope no one would say, Brad, you shortchanged us. You are not passionate, excited. Because guess what? God's never left me. He never, I, I don't, I'm not sad if there was one of you here or if it was just me. That is the way that you and I approach because it isn't our deal. It's his deal. So trying to make it happen would be so not cool. Because guess what would have to happen? When you make it happen in your efforts and energy, guess what you get to do for the rest of your life? You get to, in your efforts and energy, make it happen. And I won't do it. I told my wife, I was like, I am an A personality. I am competitive. Don't get me wrong. I want to make things happen. And I have been to some pastor's meetings. And I'm giving you some experience out of my, my life where people are like, how many are you running? How big is your church? How much you got? And at some point, I was like, 
the definition of success and influence and the three words that God gave me, reach the city, is different. And I trust him. And I am puny. And I am small. But I know that God's big. And I never once have ever left. Because I know. I'm, I live, I do, in my heart. God's about to do something huge. Every moment of every day. Just a few months ago, some people rolled in, right? You guys all know this because I told you about it. Some people here, they were here on a little, little getaway sort of corporate adventure. They rolled in and some SUVs gave us, you know, a pretty large sum of money and rolled out. And I'm like, yep, God, I like how you roll. I like it. Do it again. <laughs> every week. But it, when, when you turn yourself over to trusting him and discerning and leaning on him, that's when he does the cool stuff. And that's when you start to experience the awesome, right? That's what he wants to do. Why? I believe this, and I, and I got it from sitting, Cole is here, by the way, he's back from Australia and uh, about to head out in a week, and we're glad to have him. He and I were sitting down and, and just chatting the other night, and something came to my heart, and it made me start sort of to well up in, in tears as we were talking, because I was thinking about why does... Why does God operate this way? Because he is the master creator of relationship. And the only way for true relationship to flourish is in trust. I can, I can sort of go through the motions with my wife, but as we've walked through the fires of trusting God in things, that aligns us. And God knows that if everything's just hunky-dory perfect for you, then, then it, it, there's not really any substance to the relationship. Those of you know, some of you fought, you've been through some tough stuff. I know some of you, you've been through bad reports from the doctor. You've been through financial crisis and hardship. You've been ugly to one another, and then you've come out still. I don't know about you, but Noel and I have been through some things like that. And the fact that we're still standing together only opens my heart bigger to her. Because we fought and we made it. And we're still standing. We may have a few flames that we're like this on, but I swear to you, when you start to think about it, and some of you, as you've imagined what it might be like, I'm sorry, this is just coming and I have to probably be quiet soon, but some of you have imagined because you've, you've been through the tenacity and the fight in that relationship and you've imagined, well, well gee, I wonder if it'd be any easier with, I see this person over here. No, no, it won't. Because the fighting and the battling and the struggles and the scars that you have give voice to victory of your relationship. And even though it doesn't feel perfect, guess what? You're still standing. And that feeling that you don't have can easily become a roaring fire of immense passion and love and goodness. And all you have to do is just give attention and focus to it. And all you have to do is open your heart. Because that's the beauty as we trust God and what he's given to us. Because anything and everything where we miss it, and this is, I love the picture of the definition of the word sin in the New Testament. It means to miss the mark. And, and I try to define this a lot. <clears throat> this gets a little bit, you know, uh, you know sometimes we, we think about it and sometimes we don't. But God has a prize set aside in his wisdom, in his discernment, and his understanding. Everything that he brings to your attention in scripture is the high prize. And where we, where we sin or we miss it is when we begin to believe and not trust that that high prize is not the very best that God has for us, so we try other things. I can identify those things as what we know as sin. See, because our definition of sin means to be separated from God and for us to burn in hell. Wrong. Because Jesus, 100%, at the cross and through his resurrection obliterated the problem of separation between you and me. Our only responsibility is to respond to his love and accept him into our lives. And you and I, the Bible says, become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, second part here though, of where sin enters in, is when we start to trust the very best possible way to live. Now, guys, and girls, sorry, pornography, okay, 
sin, missing the mark, because the high prize that God has set up gets distracted in our brains, and instead of feeling condemnation and guilt, God's desire is not for us to, to go through the motions of condemnation and guilt and, God, forgive me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. God's desire is that you and I would get a picture of the high prize of what he has for you in your relationship and trust that all of it, the intimacy, the relationship, the communication can be the very best possible thing you've ever imagined. Are you with me? Whoa, it was a little quiet on that one. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to something else. I feel like, like I'm, uh, now I'm uh, going to tell jokes or something. Um, you, you fashion that to anything that God set up. Why? You know, oftentimes, you know, I, I look throughout the Bible and, you know, some of you who've been hanging around E3, and I haven't even gotten to my notes yet. This is not good. This is not good. Stop for just a second. Let's, let's, let's dive into this. The wisdom and the discernment and the understanding that God has set up for you in your life to be able to operate in generosity and forgiveness and trust. And anything that you think is like sin, my desire is that your perspective would change to look at it from wisdom. Do you know why? Uh, I, I like to bring up the ones that, oh my God. You know why adultery is, is a bad deal? Because this relationship doesn't get to be the very best possible thing if I'm having an affair over here. Okay? Whoa, okay. You know, before you get all scared, you know why? Because the energy and effort that would go to make this the very best possible thing, it gets stolen. Are you with me? I mean, God's not like out to get you. He's like, hey, check this out. If you want this thing to be awesome... Then, then diverting yourself and distracting yourself over here is it, just not going to be any good. But we want, you know, church, we got to get this too because, you know, we want to crucify sinners. No, that's not, that's not what God's desire is. God's desire is, and I was telling somebody this the other night, it's like, do you believe, as a follower of Jesus, do you believe that this is the best possible way to live? Some of you you, you may say, yes, I do, but if you took account of your life, the answer is, no, I don't. And that's, I, I'm not busting on you. I guess I would say, why not ask for some wisdom and understanding to get perspective so that you could understand the best possible thing that God has for you? Is that all right to say? And then, when you get it, and you get excited about it, guess what? Other people that are surrounding you who are living contrary to the best possible way to live, instead of making them feel guilty and horrible and bad, and I'm a Christian and I don't do that stuff and I don't do this and do that, what if they began to be showed by a group of people that this is the best possible way to live? And as a community, we, we didn't, you know, make people feel bad uh, if they didn't, you know, experience this thing, but what if we opened up our hearts and we said, you know, listen, here's what I've experienced. And I want us this year to look at that because I think that there's some things to tap into like the laws of gravity and like the laws of aerodynamics for us to begin to soar in. And this whole hero challenge for me has been about us transforming, us taking and, 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 and surrendering and opening up our hearts so that we could see it. Are you with me? Your relationships, your physical body, what does God have to say about it? I mean, some of you, if you trusted what God said about you, then your whole identity and the fact of your roller coaster of feeling bad and then feeling better and feeling bad and, and thinking that you're a failure and then this and that and the other, if you trusted God, what he said about you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he lives on the inside of you, that he'll never leave you for, or forsake you. If you believe that, that would lead you to the best possible life. If you looked at your finances and you recognize that God's desire for us, because he, he emulated it, he gave. Generosity is awesome. 
I, I, I don't even know what else to say besides it's awesome. And it doesn't start with having a lot. It starts with a perspective change. How can I be generous? Who can I make some cookies for? Who can I call up on the phone and tell them that they're awesome? How can I live my life in such a way? Because Jesus demonstrated it. And if you want your life to be super awesome and you want to accept the challenge, then you allow yourself to be that way. And the people who sneer and snicker and you feel judged and condemned by, let it roll off of you and be a blessing to them and encourage them. And all of a sudden, God begins to open up to us. And it's going to take some things in order for us to experience this. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take that you and I write down a picture, a vision for our 2013. Write down our goals of where we want to see things and write down some steps in order to be able to see those things come to pass. But undergirding it all is a prayer for wisdom and understanding. Will you join me this morning in a prayer for that? Bow your head and close your eyes. Let's take a moment of just silence in yourself to just search and seek and just silently just begin to ask, God, where are some areas that I, I, I need to open up because maybe because of hurt, maybe because of whatever reason, I've just sort of held them back. But you, God, you are the giver of life. You are the leader of the best possible way to live. And those areas where I've not trusted, where I've mistrusted, where I've held back and had really just unbelief, God, give us a heart of faith this morning. Give us a heart of faith to see the person that you've brought us as a spouse, that this is the person that you've given to us, to stand with us in this life, to stand beside and to strengthen. If we can get this, God, that when two or three are gathered together, there's tremendous power and anything's possible. Father, help us to love in a richer, deeper way. Help to stir our hearts for intimacy. God, we are passionate about getting your wisdom, gaining a heart of understanding here this morning. We do not want to go another day lifting up things that we think are important, that we are struggling and toying for, finances and status and stuff. God, you're everything. You are everything. This morning, Lord, we offer our hearts and our lives to you, every single aspect. Lord, 2013 will be a year marked by the supernatural power of God. It will be a year where you do some miraculous things that we can't explain so that you are the one and you alone who will get the glory. Father, that our relationship with you would grow richer and deeper as we learn to trust you, as we learn to pray bold prayers, take bold steps, reach out and love people and be generous in a way that we've never been. God, we love you. You can be trusted. We surrender our ideas. We surrender our thoughts. We surrender the pictures. We just want you. Thank you for every relationship and friendship and marriage and person and everything that it represents, God. Lead us, guide us, and use us. In Jesus' name, amen.